through the Word of God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You're right, brother. It's a great set. <laughs> I'll fight the battles where? What did we just sing about? On my knees. On my knees. Hmm. In case you haven't realized yet, talking about prayer, don't feel worthy of it to talk about prayer, but yet it's exciting. I love it. I need it. I don't do it enough, but thank you, Pastor Dave, for the privilege to pray. In case you didn't realize, if you're visiting for the first time, I'm not the senior pastor. The senior pastor's right down here, that good-looking gentleman right there in the front row. Yeah. But I, I always been in the ministry a long time, both, both of us together. Great privilege to always to preach. It's humbling. It's, uh, it's exciting, challenging, all at the same time. Prayer. What is prayer? <clears throat> what is prayer? If you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew 26. I'm not going to start there. That's I'm eventually going to get to that point. I'm talking about spiritual disciplines, and it's come at a good time. It's always a good time to practice spiritual disciplines. It's talked about the scriptures, Pastor Dave, and preaching, meditation, solitude, and silence. A lot of great passages, some that I even anticipated using, but you notice he didn't say prayer. He didn't go to the next part. There was prayer there along with when Jesus drew apart. Those are all great seed. That's great ground. How many of you like the farm? Gardening, that kind of thing. I hate gardening. I stink at it. And we're black thumbs. We love looking at flowers. We've had some in there in our last place. It's beautiful to look at. Just not good at it. But you have to prepare the ground, right, to see the fruit grow, right? You prepare that soil. It makes a major difference. And all these things, these spiritual disciplines, they don't in and of themselves make you spiritual. But they sure help when you align yourself under those. It's the way that God uses. It's the means that he uses to minister to our hearts, to bring us into a closer walk with him. <laughs> the battle is won on our knees. Well, the battle's already been won on the cross, hasn't it, through Jesus Christ? It's been won. But have you been victorious? How are you doing in your own development? If you're, if you're feeling a little bit dry, if you're sensing, Lord, I'm just not experiencing the joy of the Lord and the peace of God, it could be that maybe you're not practicing some of these spiritual disciplines. I'm, not, I'm trying to be careful, and I'm not laying a guilt trip on you. I'm just challenging you just like I'm challenging myself. I have seen when my own spiritual development gets real thin, feels shallow. I don't sense the presence of God. And it's most likely because I'm not praying in the way that I could, and I need to. I need to. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us. We need the Word of God to help us. Prayer, somebody said, is the gymnasium of the soul. Isn't that good? I mean, it's hard. I maybe like to work out. I used to. Man, a few hands went up. Prayer is the gymnasium of the soul. I feel better when I exercise. It affects my body. It does. It feels better. It hurts while I'm in process. It's hard. It's challenging. I'm not always motivated to want to exercise, but it's hard work. But you reap the benefits of exercise, just like anything else. It takes discipline. Prayer. You can't leave out prayer. It's communion with God. What is prayer? If I was to ask you what is prayer, yell it out. How would you define what prayer is? Anybody? Talking to God. Yeah. We listen, too. Somebody might say, well, I haven't heard audibly from God lately. But we do hear from God, don't we? How do we hear from God? The Word. Right here. And the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God. He brings it to your mind and to your heart. He brings it to recall. We've been talking about Holy Spirit. Well, we've only met once in the weather conditions, our Bible study. Brother, you're meeting tonight, right? Life group, 6 o'clock, right here. And we'll meet Wednesday at Mike's house. If you want to know where that is, just see Mike or see me. Mike's in the back there. Put your hand up, Mike. He's way in the back. Okay. Uh, so prayer is so important in so many levels. It's the gymnasium of the soul. It takes work, but the Holy Spirit helps you. He encourages you. He woos you to himself. And we need all these things. I need this. 
Okay? What is prayer? It's conversation with Christ. It's talking to God. It's letting him know where you're at, even though he knows where you are. Yes, he can read your mind. <laughs> uh, he still wants us to pray. It's that intimacy with him. Do you want to draw closer to Jesus? I do. You say, well, he's already close. He already loves you. If you're, if you're a child of God, he lives in you. But he wants us to experience that close fellowship. I need it. We all need it. He desires of that. He desires of us to know his heart and to know how much he loves us. So it's a privilege. Somebody else said, Daniel Henderson said, it's intimacy with God that leads to the fulfillment of God's purposes. Prayer, hmm, so important. Why pray? If he already knows what's going to happen, maybe he's determined, some people say, predeterminism, whatever. He knows what's going to happen at the end. He's got his plans. He's a sovereign God, and he is. I mean, it's, it's not like he doesn't know what's going to happen. And it's not fatalism, by the way. <laughs> Why do we still pray? If he knows my mind, if he knows my heart, he knows what I'm thinking. I've had people ask me that over the years. Well, let me, number one, why pray? Because he commands it. Luke 18, 1. <clears throat> I should have told you, you put up that scripture, but Luke 18, 1 says Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always what? Pray. They should always pray and not lose heart or not give up. Don't faint. That's also a principle in there's is persistence. Are you persistent in prayer? Am I persistent in prayer? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you, I mean, are you spending any time in prayer? Are you allowing God to do a work in you? He so wants to encourage you and to know how much he loves you and show you his plans. And he does that through the word of God, but the spirit of God also uses the word of God to show you his plan and his will. He commands us to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says this, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? It's continual prayer. Yeah, how can you do that? When I'm at work, what if I'm in conversation with somebody, I'm on the computer or whatever you're doing. You can't always audibly start talking out loud and say, okay, now I'm going to pray here in the middle of your workplace and you have a, a business meeting. How is that possible, pray without ceasing? It's an attitude, it's a mindset that Christ is always here. And you're a child of God. He lives in you. It's a mindset. I'm in an attitude of prayer. Lord, I need you. You can take, when he's the center of your life, when he is everything to you, there's never a moment when he's not with you and you can continue to converse with him in prayer. Lord, I need you. It could be a quick prayer. Thank you, Father, for this meeting. Thank you for giving me strength through this time. Thank you for helping me at work. It's just this conversation. It's a relationship. He also ordains the means as well as the ends. Even if you believe that he has everything all designed, everything is going to take place as it is. I think Isaiah 14, 24 says, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And I have purposed. And as I have purposed, so it will happen. Listen, he still ordains the means. I don't understand how he brings the two together. My prayer time, with God, what I do in my prayer, I still believe affects change because I look to the Lord to bring about that change. I need to draw closer to him. I pray for the salvation of lost people. I believe God uses those prayers to bring about change. Even though he already knew what would happen, because he's God, he's sovereign. He ordains the means, too. He ordains our prayers. He ordains those things. That's a part of his plan. And so I still pray. And I've seen the change that occurs in my life when I do seek him. Call upon me, Scripture says. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Anybody faced any trouble lately? Anybody sick and tired of being sick and tired sometimes or just worn out? Call upon me. I will you know, fight your battle on your knees. We need him. It's not a, I have to do this. Boy, okay, I better check that off. Up, oh, did my Bible read. Up, oh, did my prayer for a few minutes. So much more than that. It's a relationship. He wants you to be in on it. Not just looking from the outside in. Even as a believer, sometimes you can be on the outside in if you're walking in the flesh. Been there, done that. That's why the Bible says to walk in the Spirit. It also says to pray in the Spirit. 
If I'm walking in the Spirit, that means I'm allowing him to have complete control of my life. If I'm praying in the Spirit, it's the same thing. When I'm walking in the Spirit, he's going to bring to mind what God's will is. Or here's how I'm thinking about an issue that maybe is not so good. You need to repent of that and change. But he also lets you know how much I love you. I'm reminding you of these things. I'm showing you these things because there needs to be a change because I want you to know how much I love you. It also benefits us. When you pray for one another, when you pray for people, guess who gets to be a part of that benefit when God answers? You. You know what that does to your prayer life? Strengthens it. Lord, thank you. Thank you for using little old me to bring about change. I don't change the people. Somebody said before you go to people about God, whether it be evangelism or encouragement or whatever it is throughout your day, Lord, help me to be all there. Go to, the, go to God about the people before you go to the people about God. Isn't that good? No? Isn't that good? I thought so. It didn't come from me. Somebody far wiser than me, but I thought it was good, so I thought I'd repeat it. When you see God show up in powerful ways, you can't take credit for it. He brings about change in your life. He brings about change in my life, at the workplace, in your family, with your children. Lord, drive this home to them. Talk to God. You benefit in that. That's another reason why we are to pray. There's so many reasons. It restores fellowship. Psalm 51.10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. You know how many times I prayed that prayer? And if I hadn't memorized it, as Pastor Dave has challenged us in weeks gone by, if that wasn't last week, I don't recall, memorizing God's word. I don't know how many times the Holy Spirit has brought that to my mind for encouragement, for conviction, and for change. Created me a clean heart? Is my heart clean before you, God? He knows it. It's almost like he's saying, do a Genesis work in my heart, oh God. What did he do in Genesis? He began the world. He created it. He started fresh. That's what I'm asking God to do. Give me a fresh start. Help me to know you in a fresh way. These simple truths that we have heard time and time again about the gospel and who Jesus is, Make them fresh in my heart and my mind. Are they stale to you this morning? Are you kind of looking from the outside in, so to speak, or does it really, are you really feeling close to God? He desires that if you're not. He doesn't want you to run away from him. I'll never do it. I'll never succeed. No, he wants you to run to him. Come to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you what? Rest. It restores fellowship. I was just reading this morning, praying. and <laughs> In that verse, creating me a right spirit. I don't know, it just hit me just this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Timothy 1.7, a friend of mine was preaching on that at a seminary recently. And I, I oh, 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. I thought to myself, hmm, how am I doing? Do I have that right spirit, or do I have that spirit of fear? I need a right spirit, Lord. Why do I fear? Why, do we, why are we afraid? Why don't we have that spirit of power? Yes, spirit of power. It's power from the Holy Spirit. It's power from God. He wants you to experience that as you grow in your faith. How are you doing? Love, love for God and love for people in a sound, disciplined mind. You also, why pray for the salvation of others? Romans 10.1. Paul said this, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they might be saved. Huh, he prayed for unbelievers. Even though he knew full well who sovereign God is, he's all powerful, he knows everything, God wants us to pray. And if he tells us to do something, I guess we should do it. I'm not smart enough not to. Why should I think that I know better than God? Obedience, you ever hear this as a kid? Brings blessing. One person knew, Pastor Dave. <laughs> I know, you know.
when you're overwhelmed with sorrow and trouble. Look at Matthew 26. Matthew 26. This ministered to my heart as well. There's so many things that I have needed, especially recently, just an encouragement in God's word. I needed that renewal. So it's perfect timing. I'm grateful to Pastor Dave in getting us in these spiritual disciplines. I knew these things, but I wasn't really experiencing them the way that I needed to. How about you? Are you memorizing God's word? Are you, are you reading it? Are you meditating on it? Because it, when it saturates your whole being and it's in your heart and your mind, the Spirit of God will use that to encourage you in so many levels or to bring you under conviction if you need it. Somebody once said, God, he prayed, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad prayer. Matthew 26, look at this, verse 36. Jesus went with his disciples. He's going to Gethsemane. <laughs> Are you overwhelmed with sorrow, trouble? He went with his disciples, verse 36, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there. And do what? Eat. I've done that before. Go home and eat. Have my bowl of cereal or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with having a bowl of cereal. Nothing wrong with watching TV. But how many times do we think about just going apart, maybe in your own bedroom, and just saying, Lord, I need you. Setting apart a place. Jesus went to a place. Pastor Dave looked at some scriptures last week. He went to a mountain by himself to do What? To pray, to spend time with his father. Sit here while I go over there and pray. Verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Been there? <laughs> Maybe sorrow for your own sin. Maybe sorrow for the trials you're going through. Maybe sorrow for what's been done to you. Overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He literally was going to the cross. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground. By the way, that's interesting. I'm not talking about a theology of posture, but sometimes that indicates what's happening in here. Have you ever fallen on your face before God? Have you ever gotten on your knees before God? It usually signifies an intensity of prayer. Not always. That doesn't mean you need to. People prayed standing up. People got laid prostrate. It's the heart. It's the posture of your heart. But in this case, it indicated some pain. Hmm. He fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. By the way, there's surrender. He returned to his disciples, found them, what? How many of you ever fallen asleep in your prayer? When I first, <laughs> okay, there's a few honest people in here. Oh, okay, I did too. When I first started at Westview Healthy Living, I've been chaplain there for a little over eight years, pastor and chaplain. And, uh, I went to two residence rooms, two guys. They're not there anymore. I swear it was the hottest room I have ever been in in my life. <laughs> it was like 90 degrees. I would usually pray for people. When I started to pray, I was so tired. I felt like my brain was mush. I started to fall asleep on my own prayer. I was so embarrassed, I, I kind of... Startled myself, looked up, and I was kind of looking at him. I was hoping he didn't see me, hoping he wasn't aware enough <laughs> that I had actually fallen asleep. My goodness. Do whatever it takes. Stand up. But just let the Lord, just tell, and if you do that, just tell him, God, I need help. Walk around. I've walked around. I prayed when I'm driving. I banged on the steering wheel. Lord, help. I need you. But I've also given him thanks. You've been there? Been in those mountaintops, Lord, you are good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Overwhelmed with sorrow, Jesus said, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from you, not as I will, but as you will. He returned to his disciples and found them snoring, sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? You know, 15, 20 years ago, George Barna did a little survey, and I don't know if I always agree with some of them. I always wonder how they came up with some of these surveys, but they said the average Christian prays, what do you think, how many minutes a day? Again, I'm not laying out as a guilt trip. I'm just challenging you. Let the Spirit of God use it. You know, only you know and only I know if my heart's really in it. Am I praying? Am I making time to spend with him? 
Could you not watch one hour? I'm thinking an hour. How much time do you spend in prayer? I mean, if you have no idea at all, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you need to pray more. Five minutes was the average. That was a good 20 years ago. I bet it's probably less than that. I, go, I know, again, it's not about time, but it might indicate something. What's going on in here? I mean, I watch a lot more than five minutes of TV. How about you? Anybody care to put your hand? No, don't put your hand up. I'm not here to embarrass you. I mean, what does that say? How much time I'm spending in this? If we wonder if we're weak spiritually, if we wonder why I'm not sensing the presence of God and the peace of God and the joy of the Lord in my life, maybe it's because I haven't been in the gym of prayer or Bible reading. And it's, it's not like it's all drudgery, if I, if I leave that impression. It's just initially sometimes hard. Because why? Because the flesh does what? Cries out sometimes against it. But the more you get into it, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God. It's rich. It encourages you. And you, you get to a point where I can't do without it. I need him. I so desperately need him. <laughs> hmm. Watch with me and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It also helps you against temptation. Okay? Sorrow, temptations, and the fellowship of the saints. He asked his, his men to pray with him. You want to know why corporate prayer is so important? There are many people who gather together in corporate prayer. Do that. Pray with people. We need one another. We need to encourage one another and pray for one another. So, so vitally important. How do we pray? How do we pray? In Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. I think you know this. By the way, have an open Bible in your prayer time. Have the Bible open while you are praying at the same time. Have you ever prayed scripture? Many of you know this prayer, and I use it because it's familiar for most people. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That may not be in this. Some say they've taken it out. Listen, it's a pattern for prayer. It doesn't mean you have to pray it word for word. But it is still important. Because sometimes we get stuck in a rut. Somebody said a rut is like being in the grave with both ends kicked out. You're stuck. And you might pray the same phrases over and over again. And Jesus gave us some help here. Here's some principles. This then is how you should pray. It's not what you need to pray word for word. It's, it's a pattern. There's various elements that are very important that you can pray about. Huh. It's good stuff. And he says before that, it's not babbling. It's not repeating phrases over and over again. I saw a bumper sticker in a car that they said, help America, pray the rosary. Well, I've got a lot of folks where I work. There's a lot who are, who are Catholics. And, you know, they're well-intentioned, but gravely misled. It's unbiblical. We don't pray Hail Mary. God is offended by that. Hail who? Praise the Lord. Our Father. Starts that way. Our Father. Mary is not the mediator. Jesus is the middleman, the mediator to, uh, to God. Truth matters. I don't say that because I mean I love them. I'm thankful for some of them. Some of them are serious about God. and they, I believe many of them love the Lord God. They really know him. But that teaching is not lining up with God's word. So we would not be loving if we did not proclaim truth to you. There are certain ways that are, that are good to pray and others that are not good to pray. He says, don't babble often with these repeated phrases over and over and over again. You don't have to pray this, by the way, be with me. Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> I've prayed that. Be with me. God, and be with me. My wife and I heard that. I heard Alistair Begg the other day on the radio. God, be with me here. Be with, wait a second. It's not that he's going to get angry at you, but... Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't God already with us? Don't need to pray it. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age for every believer. 
I'll never leave you or what? Forsake you? So it's easy to get stuck in a rut, and I've been guilty of it, and I've prayed that before. God bless me. What does that mean? I've prayed that before. I'm not saying it's bad. Just think about what you're praying. So who do we address? Our Father. Okay? You can address it, Jesus. I prayed to Jesus before I prayed to the Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me. But I generally pray to our Father, and here's, a, here's an example, our Father who art in heaven. Okay? We pray to the Father, essentially, through the Son, um, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Father is the object of our prayers as believers. So how do we come to him? We come in humility, reverently. Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke 18. Listen, are you really praying? I want you to pray. That's what I want most of all. What's the most important thing? There's a variety of ways to pray. Scripture talks about in Timothy. Pray for those in authority. Pray for, you know, your city. Pray for your church. Lord knows, I know Pastor Dave and I would love you to be praying for us and praying for this church when we come together. It's so vitally important. When you come prepared to listen to God's word, it's encouraging. When you know the Holy Spirit of God has made you, given you ears to hear with the intention of really listening, it's a beautiful thing. It, it knits our hearts together when we pray for one another. I'll covet them. I know he covets them. And I know that you covet the prayers from us and each other as well. Pray. We need that. Luke 18. There are ways to pray and ineffective ways to pray. Luke 18, verse 9. To some who are confident of their own righteousness, you don't come smugly, you come humbly. Some look down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. They were looked upon as the scum of the earth, not highly respected. They took more off the top than they should have. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this way. <laughs> stood by himself and prayed. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Another translation says, and he prayed thus with himself. <laughs> Robbers, evildoers, I'm not like them. Adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He's right, he's not like them. He's worse. <laughs> you know why? Because he's so filled with what? Pride in himself. You ever met anybody like that? So full of themselves? Wow. It doesn't help our prayer lives one bit. Tax collector stood at a distance. What did he do? Verse 13. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast, and he said what? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me. Who am I? He was humble. He came reverently. He didn't come with his smug pride. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit will minister to your heart if there's any pride. He'll show you. Pride stinks. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. By the way, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's a good prayer to pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need you. Forgive me. And he will. But I need that even as a believer. Once I came to faith in Christ, I need it every day. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Even though I'm a saint now because of what Christ has done for me, I still can be pathetic in my attitude, in my actions. I need him. And I need prayer. Prayer helps us. Use this prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Have you ever used Scripture to help you pray? Let the Word of God inform your heart and your mind, which then helps you in your prayer life. Hmm. Melanie Griffith. You ever heard of her? Some of you have that are my age. Some others may not have. Actress. She has a prayer diary. When you talk about who you're praying to, and in it she addresses it this way. Dear inner self, if it's your will, please reveal to me in a dream the secret of my success in order to become closer to you with love and respect. Melanie. Sounds odd. and It's weird, isn't it? And sad. Disillusioned. I have no idea. So many people are so confused. I remember at the college, one of the schools where my kids went to, 
when they prayed this prayer at a, what do you call those things with a spiritual service? Baccalaureate. Thank you. Couldn't think of the word. This guy got up and began to pray to the mother of all and mother of all ladies and all this other crazy stuff. I like, what in the world? This school started off somewhat of a religious good school, decent school. Do you see how far we've drifted in our culture? Another one told a pastor, don't pray in Jesus' name because you're going to be in front of all kinds of people in the community. It was a large city with people of all kinds of different faith. I'm sorry. I can't pray in any other way but in Jesus' name and to our Father who art in heaven. How sad. And this Pharisee was praying essentially to himself, God, I thank you <laughs> that I'm not like all these other bums. Are you kidding me? That prayer shuts it down. God is not listening to that. I mean, he hears, but he's not really listening. Matthew 6. So how do we pray? How do we pray? Look at it real quickly in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, how to be thy name. There's reverence. Who God is. Give him glory. It's praise. It's worship. Our Father in heaven, we want to honor your name. And not just your name. It's the person whose name it represents. He's God Almighty. He's high and holy and lifted up. He's a sovereign God. Yes, in one hand, he's in heaven. He's far away, and yet he's our Father, and he's right here. He's near when he's your Father. Psalm 23, the Lord is who, shepherd? When you know him as your Savior, he's your shepherd. He loves you. A shepherd loves his sheep, and they go astray a lot. They can be pretty dumb. I know I can. He's our Father. He loves us. Reverence. Give him praise. The focus is on God first and foremost, not give me, give me, give me. And I've done that before. Although it is right to pray for something, yes, but reverence. Reverence. What do you see? He goes on. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our response. You see the reverence, and now you see the response. What's the response? When you see who God is and who I'm not, that he's worthy and I'm not, that he's holy and I'm not, I mean, even though we're set apart, we are called saints, it, it causes a response to that reverence that you first looked at, who he is. What's your response? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, help me to do your will. That's submission, surrender. One individual at work, I asked the group in a Bible study, what do you think? Some keys to prayer. He spoke up out of the blue and he said, surrender. 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 When you yield everything to God and let him be God. He said, I was blind. I literally experienced some blindness and I had no idea what was happening. And I, I said, that must have been unnerving. He says, a little unnerving. But I knew I had family and many others praying for me. Did you see that? He sensed the prayers of God's people. Please pray for one another. Please. He said, I sensed the prayer, and I prayed, and I, I gave up control. I didn't have any control anyway. And I experienced the peace of God come flooding in my soul. How many of you want that peace? We get the peace from the Prince of Peace. Why else would we expect anything less? He tells us to come to him. He wants to give good gifts to his children because he loves you. I love it. Hmm. Prayer. Reverence, response, request. Where do you see the request? Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. That's our provision. How many times have you prayed, God, I need a job. God, I need fun funds to put food on the table. God, I need this. Those are all appropriate. Here he's talking about daily bread. That's our daily provisions. Our basic needs and provisions. But I think the whole thing, and of course, obviously we need spiritual provision. <laughs> Jesus said, right, you need the word, the bread of life, you need me. So the main thing is, is not to look at the provisions, but look at the who? The provider. Look at the provider. Hmm. Are you praying? I mean, it's a win-win situation. It honors God because you honor his name when prayer is answered. But it also blesses you. Don't you want to be blessed? So it's okay. There, there it is. Bless them. <laughs> I guess it's okay, isn't it? Request. Reverence, response, request, and readiness. 
Lord, help me to be ready. But he goes on to others as well. Forgive us our debts. How many of you got somebody you're upset about, you're upset at? Forgive us as we've forgiven our others. Jesus, because he forgave us, we're supposed to forgive. You say, I've already been forgiven. I already came to Christ. Yes, that's true. Positionally, you are free. All your sins are covered. Washed in the blood. Jesus paid some. No, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. We owe him everything. And because he's forgiven me, think about your own sin. And think about just, not even just the levels of sin, but the fact that we were condemned to die because we had the wrath of God upon us until we came to Christ. Think about that. How could I not forgive somebody else? And when I don't forgive somebody else, I bottle up that presence. I mean, God's still with me, but I don't experience his love in the way that he wants me to. I hate to say this. Again, I'm admitting my patheticism, if that's a word. It is today. Thank you, brother. Very gracious as usual. I was upset at my dad. He don't listen online, so I don't have to worry about it. He doesn't even know what the phone is. <laughs> New fangled phone. He had one of those old flip phones, you know. I know. My wife is going. I was upset at him. Made some comments. It just, I don't know why it bothered me. It didn't initially until I started thinking about it. You see how stupid I can be? You see how the flesh can raise up its ugly head? I didn't like talking to him. And I knew my, my life, my prayer life, and my spiritual development was not what it needed to be. I'm driving home on my way to get a pizza. I love pizza. I had time. It wasn't ready yet. But even if it was ready, the Spirit of God is telling me, you're going right by your dad's house. You need to pull over. You need to go say hi. You say, this is silly. Is it? Are you dealing with any bitterness? I went, knocked on the door, and said, that I didn't say, I'd already said to God, forgive me for my sin. Dad didn't even know. I just told him I love him. I gave him a hug, and I prayed with him and BJ because he's not doing real well. But I knew in my heart the battle had been won. Yes, the battle's already been won, what Christ did on Calvary, but I, I won a little daily victory right then that day. And duh, I already know that principle. Forgive as you've been forgiven. I didn't want to. I was wrong. It opened it up. I'm telling you, I've received more books. There's some good books. I heard Dave, Pastor Dave just mentioned one this morning that I just got from my brother about spiritual disciplines. I just got a book that I'm going to share just a few thoughts here that's really ministered to my heart, gentle and lowly. Now, obviously, the greatest book is right here. <laughs> but even Paul said, give me the parchments. Give me the other things. Sometimes it's good to read other materials, and it spurred me on on some basic principles that really encouraged me about the love of Christ. Listen, guys, he wants you to grow in your relationship with him. Do you know how much he loves you? I sometimes forget to remember how much he really loves me. I don't really grasp it. These are basic, simple principles, so many forgiveness, praising him, submitting to him. One more, and I'm not going to even cover the whole thing. Go to Ephesians. This is phenomenal. You say, that's the prayer that Jesus told us to pray. Look at this last one. There are many prayers in Scripture. This one is from the Apostle Paul. You ought to read this and meditate on it. It's really blessed my heart. I'm still reading it. I'm going to be getting away this week, do a little two-day, a day-and-a-half sabbatical just to spend some more time with the Lord. My brother's been on a nine-week sabbatical. I'm not doing that. Well, not yet. I don't know, unless God directs me to it. I had a friend who did a 40-day fast. I don't know if I could do that. But he said the blessing that took place spiritually was amazing. Ephesians chapter 3. This is a prayer from Paul. What does he say in verse 14? Check it out. It's a prayer for God's power to change us. For this reason, what reason? All the previous chapters. God has called us. He set us free. He's adopted us. If you know anybody think about adoption, parents choose that child. They love that child. They desire that child, and they want that child to know how much they love them. They're a part of their family with all the benefits. And Paul's saying, for this reason, 
All those previous things I'm not looking at in previous chapters and chapters one and two. Dead in my sin. Deader than a doorknob. Couldn't do a thing to earn God's favor. Why would he choose me? Why would he choose you? Why would he forgive me? I was headed for hell. And I still sin because of the grace of God. For this reason, what's he do? I kneel. Again, there he is again. There's a certain amount of intensity. It's an exceptional degree of earnestness. Can you do that standing up? Yes. Think about sometimes your posture. Maybe you need to, maybe that can help drive you, your heart, the posture of your heart into a seriousness of prayer. What we do with our hearts is most important in submitting to him. From whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray, there it is again, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may do what? Strengthen you with power. How many need that strength with power? Through his what? His spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in your inner being. How's your inner being? Anybody need your inner being, your spiritual man strengthened to know him more and to know who he is and his plan for your life? Pray, Paul says. Pray for power from God through the Holy Spirit. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What does that mean? He wants to be at home. When you go home, that's your house. You're the owner. But you know what? This body is, our te- is the temple of who? The, it's the temple of God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. Yeah, one God, three persons. This body is his temple. It's his house. What does he want from our house? When he says, let Christ dwell in your house, that means to be at home. Kick his feet up. Relax. Be able to go to every room in your house. Are you okay with him going to every room in your house? Wherever you are in your room, what you do in your room, or when you go to work, or when you go to school? And he's talking about your heart and your mind. Does he have control? Is he reigning over every area of your life? It's the same thing back in Matthew 6. Not my will, but thine be done. I surrender every area of my life. It's letting thy kingdom come is letting Christ reign in your heart. He's the king of the universe, but he wants to reign in your heart. Are you letting every area of your heart and your mind? Is it pure? Is it set apart? What are you looking at? And even if you're not looking at or doing anything that's quote unquote really bad, are you allowing him to have everything so that you pursue him and know how much he loves you? You're missing out. You may not be doing anything super bad, but we're missing out on the love of God in a relationship with him. He not only saves us from sin, but he wants us to, he saves us to know him better, sanctifies us. How you doing? He wants to reign in your heart. And he says, so I pray that you'd be strengthened with power in your inner being so Christ may feel at home in you. Let him reign in your heart that you may have power together with all God's people. Did you get that, by the way? All the Lord's holy people. Pastor Dave said something about we need to come together. We come together to worship him. Thank you for being here. And that's half the battle. We show up. But then we let our inner being also be touched and moved and changed and transformed. We respond, but we need God's people. God uses his people. He uses his people. He uses the church of God, the people of God, to better experience the love of God. Did you hear that? It's so true. That's why we need each other. How many people do you know that have drifted off? They're able to come, but they don't come. Some aren't coming because of sickness. And Lord knows And we allow the Holy Spirit to minister to their hearts when they're ready. There's some, though, in other churches all across the nation. I've talked to people at work. They're not going anywhere. They're just listening online. And thank God we have that to meet people's needs as well. But when you're able, and the Spirit of God's, God's ultimate desire is for us to come together. It's so infrequent that we do it. So thank you for being here. Don't forsake the assembling of fellowshipping together, right? He knows what happens when we show up and we listen to the word of God and we grow and we strive to apply the word of God and in prayer and in worship. Mm. I don't always appreciate the love of God. I don't. I don't always... This isn't a prayer, by the way. This last verse, he prays that you, verse 17, 
I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp. You say, wait a second, we're already saved. Why is he praying for that? You already know Christ. You know of his love to some degree. But he's saying, it's almost like we're saying, God, I don't really know and appreciate how much you really do love me. Not enough. I pray that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He wants you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Question, how do you know the unknowable? Good question, I'm not fully sure. Other than that I do know, based on what the Spirit of God has shown me and I've experienced in my own life forgiveness of Christ, that he loves me, I know that. And the more you spend time in his word and prayer, the basic things and meditation and scripture, memorization, and coming together and let him do a work in you. Lord, I need you. I don't even get it. I don't even know half the things he even just said this morning. I need you. Guess what the Holy Spirit will do? He'll show you. He'll give you an awareness. He'll give you understanding as you do what he desires us to do. And you'll begin to understand that love, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the it's immense. Matthew Henry said the apostle's words, what he wanted to see was that the exceeding greatness of the love of Christ, which is higher than the heaven, deeper than hell, longer than the earth, and broader than the sea. Isn't that good? John Stott said about that verse, Christ's love, broad enough to encompass all mankind. I'm a part of that. Amen, aren't you? And you are too. Long enough to last for eternity. Deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner. <laughs> That's me. And high enough to exalt him to heaven. I went to my son's church. I had no idea how encouraging this book would be. He's in Columbus. And it's just it's talking about what we just talked about. Better appreciating the love of God, his empathy, Hebrews, which you've, we've been through. He empathizes with us. Some people think God doesn't know me. He doesn't care about me. Wrong, wrong, wrong. He suffered. He loves you. But, and there's so much, I'm just going to share this and I'll close in prayer. Listen, I want you to know and experience the love of God. This prayer, by the way, when he says, I want you to know his love, it's not praying, and I prayed this before, it's not bad prayer. It's not that you would love him more. Though that's a good prayer. I pray that, Lord, help me to love you more with all my heart, all my strength, all my soul, all my mind. That's a good prayer. But I think this is just as good if not better. God is saying, I want you to know how much he loves you. I mean, when you really get that, it'll make a difference. John 6, 37, he that comes to me, I will not cast out. Listen to this. We have a problem with that sometimes. Some do. I do. We are factories. He said, we as anxious sinners, we get discouraged. We think he won't love us. I've blown it too many times. He says, we are fresh factories. Resi uh, we are factories of fresh resistances to Christ's love. We just keep putting out something new. Nope, nope, he can't love me. No, there's no way. Look what he says. John Bunyan, or Bunyan, said this. <clears throat> How we deflect Christ's assurances of love. No, wait, we say, cautiously approaching Jesus. You don't understand. I've really messed up in all kinds of ways. I know, he responds. You know most of it, sure, certainly more than what others see, but there's perversity down inside me that is hidden from everyone. I know it all. Well, the thing is, it isn't just my past. It's my present, too. I understand. But I don't know if I can break free of this anytime soon. That's the only kind of person I'm here to help. Is this good? Simple, basic truths. The burden is heavy. Anybody got a heavy burden? The burden is heavy and heavier all the time. Then let me carry it. It's too much to bear. Not for me. You don't get it. My offenses aren't directed toward others. They're against you. Then I'm the one most suited to forgive them. It's so simple and yet profound, isn't it? This is the God that we serve.
But the more of the ugliness in me you discover, the sooner you get fed up with me. What do you say? Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Nothing but coming to him is required. Are you coming to him? You know, there have been times I've said, no, I've blown it so many times, he's got to be sick and tired. Now, I know it's not true, but sometimes I let it go down here. No, it's got to be true. And rather than getting encouraged and wanting to pray, you get discouraged and you don't pray. And Satan can use that. Hmm. Come to him. That's all that he requires and desires. And last thing, this is heaven's delight. I will not cast out. I will not cast you out. This is heaven's delight. Come to me, says Christ. I will embrace you into my deepest being and never let you go. I will embrace you into my deepest being. Do you need embraced today? You ever felt like God's giving you a hug? You ever felt like you're on cloud nine? You've experienced the love of God in fresh ways. You need his mercy. You need his grace. You need revival. Father, I thank you for the privilege to pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you, thank you, thank you that you even allowed us to come in to your family. You adopted us into your forever family. You've given us all the benefits through Christ Jesus. You enable us to live this life by the Holy Spirit and his power. Help us to utilize the word of God. May we bask in it. May we allow it to marinate in our hearts and our lives and our minds as we meditate upon it. And may that help us inform our prayer lives. May we hunger and thirst for you. Lord, thank you that you embrace us into your very being. You love us. Whether we're, on, we're doing well and encouraged or whether we're discouraged or battling some sin, I thank you for revival, for renewal, for restoration, for forgiveness, for your mercy. Lord, I pray these be more than just words speak to people's hearts. May this be such a living relationship, Father, that they walk in the Spirit day by day, moment by moment. Help me to do the same as we fully depend upon you. Transform our hearts and our lives, we pray in Jesus' name.